Kinsey Locke lies there, helpless, on the ground, pinned by the claws of the Shadow Fiend. The monster managed to steal the Echo Key from her and is attempting to steal back the Head Key as well. Bodhi hides behind a rock not too far away. His anxiety builds, taking full control of his body. He can do nothing more than sit and watch. His indecisiveness kills him, and he begins to hyperventilate. Then, a shadow grows over the two of them, not from the fiend, no, from their brother, Tyler. He stands stories tall and carries an even larger scowl upon his face. They cannot make out the words he says. His voice is too deep. It just booms, enough to shake the branches on the trees. Even the Shadow Fiend is caught by surprise, and this gives Bodhi just enough time to retrieve his sister. Tyler grabs the fiend and lifts it above his head before hurling it in the opposite direction of Key House. As the creature's body hits the ground, it continues to slide towards the edge of the cliff. Trees are ripped out by the roots, rocks are pushed aside, and the dirt is left permanently changed. Like a meteor crashing down from above, a trail of destruction is left in the creature's wake. Tyler gives the creature no time to react. He rushes forward, fists ready in order to land a follow-up attack while it's still on the ground. The snakes in the shadow creature's hair hiss and dance back and forth, preparing to bite and entangle the overgrown teenager. Its tail, like that of a scorpion, jabs at the open air. All the while, the shadow creature uses its massive claws to scoop up the earth into a mound and uses a sand attack to cloud Tyler's field of vision. It doesn't matter. Tyler's rage is palpable, tangible, this creature, this monster, has been tormenting his family for too long. And it ends tonight. Tyler pushes through the cloud of debris and sends out a strong left jab. Just like before, the fiend, viscous, shadowy coat is able to absorb most of the blow. However, the power from the strike proves to still be great enough to bring the creature to its knees. The creature, losing ground, sends out a counterattack, an uppercut to Tyler's ribcage. Tyler grits through the pain. He tries to retake the advantage, but the creature is able to lift Tyler up and vault him over his shoulder, over the cliff, and into the bone-chilling water below. Massive waves are created under him as he crashes down, but it's not enough to stop him, not even close. Then the creature leaps down from on top of the cliff and lunges with a jab of its own. Its punch connects with the side of Tyler's jaw. Again, the boy refuses to yield. He meets the monster with a punch of his own, making contact and stretching the blackened tar from the creature's body. And it can't help but let out a smirk, revealing all of its sharpened, sinister teeth. Now, it knows it has the upper hand. Tyler's hand and arm, by extension, is caught within the black sludge, now making it hard 
for him to escape the creature's grasp. Tyler attempts to free himself, but just like if he were to sink into quicksand, his struggles only serve to make his escape that much more difficult. Tyler stumbles left to right across the bay, trying to throw the beast off of him. And that's when he sees it. The lighthouse. The creature, still focused on attacking Tyler, does not notice the light on top of the lighthouse slowly turning in its and Tyler's direction. And Zack is caught off guard as its shine shatters his shadowy carcass. The force of the explosion pushes Tyler into the water and sends waves crashing in every direction. Then, Zack, his crown, and the Echo Key all plunge into the water one after another. Tyler, still larger than life itself, scans the water beneath him for any trace of the enemy. Zack manages to scoop up the Echo Key in his escape, but he lost both the shadow key and the crown in his fall. He washes up on the beach, nearly drowned, and hurriedly hurls up seawater before making his retreat into the shadows. And with no signs of life from his enemy, Tyler makes his way back to the coast as well. It doesn't take long for Kinsey to appear she carries her younger brother Bodhi in her right arm. He clings to her tightly. Small sobs escape him as tears run down his cheeks. It's okay, kid, she tells him. I think it's over. See, there's your big bro. No pun intended. You guys all right? Tyler asks, lowering himself to as close as eye level as possible. Yeah, Kinsey responds. You? Tyler lowers his left hand and beckons for his brother and sister to come forward. Fine, here, climb up. I want to show you something. Kinsey helps Bodhi up first before climbing up herself. Once they do, Tyler lifts them both into the air, high enough for them to see all of Lovecraft. Wow, Kinsey gasps. Wow, Bodhi adds. He's not so much concerned with the view, but with the small white crown sitting not but a few feet away from him within his brother's palm. This is home, guys, Tyler tells the two. We're not going to run from shadows here. Not tonight. Not ever. Later, just before sunrise, Nina Locke's car screeches to a halt in the key house driveway. As she crawls out of the car, she scans the area. Something's different. She just can't tell what. Nina ascends the front steps into the manor and the door swings open for her to find her home in complete disarray. Overturned flower pots, dirty clothes laid out on the floor, broken picture frames and the like. No, oh God, no. She mumbles to herself, expecting the worst. Ty, Kinsey. Bodhi? Nina opens the kitchen door to find Bodhi sitting at the counter reading his copy of Peter Pan. Hey, you're back! Bodhi says cheerfully, as if the kitchen was in any better condition than the front room. Broken dishes, pots and pans cast aside, open cabinets, her wine bottle laying on the floor open 
with its contents spilled out creating quite the hazard. What the Christ happened here? Nina grits her teeth and looks around for her two older children. I don't know, Bodhi shrugs, quite mischievously. It was like this when I woke up. How was Duncan? The clicking from Nina's cane tapping the flooring drifts into the television room, where she finds Tyler fast asleep with an ice pack on one side of his face and the ear on the other side covered up like he was in some kind of wrestling accident. Dirty laundry is scattered everywhere. Pants are on the sofa. Socks are on the table. Even a pair of black panties are carelessly draped on one of the lamps. God, I think these are mine. Tyler, she says, waking her son. When I walked in the house, I thought I was going to find you dead. In a few minutes, you're going to wish I did. Uh, yeah, Tyler groans as he fully wakes up. Me and Kinsey kind of had some friends over and shit got a little out of hand. But I will totally clean up. And pay for the broken windows. Windows? Nina asks, stepping backwards. Plural. Kinsey is reading a comic book at the bench by the birdbath when Tyler walks up with his hands in his pockets trying to keep it casual. Nice one, hiding out here. I thought you weren't afraid of anything. It's not a question of fear. Staying out of her way this morning is just good sense. How's she? Better than I thought. She didn't say much. That's cause she's ashamed. She's... The fuck are you talking about? Kinsey keeps her eyes glued to the panels in her book. Missed the fairy? Sure she did. Tyler averts his eyes, instead choosing to stare at the clouds until the moment passes, until Kinsey chooses to break the silence. Speaking of not being afraid of things, why is it okay to open Bodhi's head and take out his memory of the living shadows, but not his sense of fear? We covered this. Maybe you think your life is perfect now that you have nothing that scares you, but Bodhi is six. Without a sense of fear, I don't think the kid would look both ways before crossing the street. He'd get himself dead in 24 hours. Whereas we had to make him forget the shadows. Little turd would never sleep again. By the way, what'd you do with the crown? I put it out of reach. That's all you or anyone else needs to know. No one is going to use it to wake up those monsters ever again. Not if I have anything to say about it. Another moment passes. She'll be back, you know. The dark lady from the well. She's going to keep coming back until she finds it. The key to the black door. Yeah, well, she's going to have to come through us to get it. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. That makes one of us. Later, at Lovecraft Academy, all the students turn their heads and snicker amongst themselves as Kinsey Locke passes them by, unfazed by neither their glares nor their comments. Scott Kavanaugh bet her she wouldn't wear the life jacket to school. And, well, she's taking him up on that bet. Much to Zach's chagrin. Kinsey, where you going, girl? We expecting a flood? When Kinsey doesn't respond, Zach has no choice but to grab her by the arm. No, really, what's up with the life preserver? Some friends gave it to me, so I'm wearing it. Uh, yeah, 
Okay. Seriously. Do you have any idea how lame you look? I mean, there are people laughing. My friends will think it's cool. I'm not really worried about anyone else's opinion. Hey, Jamal, Scott. Wait, those are the friends we're talking about. Kavanaugh and Saturday? Hey, I haven't been at Lovecraft Academy any longer than you, but even I know that hanging out with those two is jumping off the social cliff into the deep seas of uncool. That's so. Well, I guess this is where I say Geronimo. Whatever. We'll talk about this at lunch. I'll be sitting with them at lunch. So, if you want to be with me, guess you'll have to jump too. Hey guys, wait up! Across campus, it seems like Tyler is having a discourse of his own. Tyler, Tyler Locke, screeches a voice from behind him. He turns around and sees that it's Jordan, fuming with rage, with a stack of papers rolled up in her hands. What's up? Tyler says nervously. Jordan? What the fuck is this? She slams the papers into his chest. An F. A fucking F. Christ, what kind of retard are you? I didn't even do the reading, and I could have faked my way to a D. Tyler, honestly amazed, grabs the papers and examines them. She flunked it? Cornwall flunked your paper? What did she say? Shows no comprehension for the core ideas. She said plot summaries are not the same as understanding. I trusted you and you fucked me, Locke. Ah! Every time I start to pity you, you turn into a fucking freak on me. Just stay the fuck away from me before you completely ruin my life. Jordan stomps away and leaves Tyler alone with the paper. He reads Miss Cornwall's notes on it one more time before drifting his attention back up to the clouds. On his way, a leaf catches his attention. He watches quietly as the wind rips it from a dying tree branch and the leaf dances in the air. And Tyler can't help but notice it starts to look pretty nice around there when the leaves start to change.